Carly Zakin, Daniel Weisberg are the co-CEOs of The Skim. If you're a millennial professional woman, you will have heard of them. And it's so fascinating to have a time to discuss with you what has been the onslaught of the pandemic, the now ups and downs of the road to recovery that we currently see. And you've been putting thought leadership out there, both of you, not only as women in the workforce, but women who run a workforce too. I'm really fascinated, Carly. Just first and foremost, what's it been like being a co-CEO of a digital media company during 2020, 2021? Oh my gosh. Well, I think first of all, the title says it all, co-CEO. I'm very grateful that I have somebody to share this with because it has been hard. We talk to any of our friends and peers who are in any leadership position. um, So much of all of our time has really transformed from a lot of external work that we're all used to in, in kind of normalcy to a lot of internal work where I feel like a lot of our majority of our time over this past year and change has been focusing on HR and, and the policies that we really need to um, create and ensure that we're creating um, the type of culture and the type of workforce that uh, we know that our, that our not only our audience needs, but that our team needs in these very unique times. Danielle, I mean, these unique times are evident not only on an anecdotal basis, but also from an economic data perspective. Day in, day out, we're looking at GDP figures, labor data that highlights, yes, we're growing, but we're growing at an unequal rate. And in particular, it's people of color, women that have been left behind in the workforce Mm -hmm. who have borne the brunt of it. What are you starting to see as we have this push-pull return to some sort of normality. How are you ensuring that, I know you've written about it, the so-called she session is something that really we continue to shine a light on? Well, I think the first thing you said is very, very true. You know, unfortunately, the pandemic is not over. We all want to be focused on a recovery. We all want to be focused on the positive here. But millions of Americans are still very much grieving the loss of jobs, and loved ones. And they are also still, you know, a very big back and forth about vaccinations. And that's going to have an effect as we're seeing on return to work dates being pushed um, and how that's going to affect working parents who they might be vaccinated, but their kids may not be um, either because of choices or because of their ages. So what we are doing day in and day out, like other business leaders throughout the country, is we are very much grappling with how our employees should return to the office. I think what makes us unique is that we are a women millennial led both uh, company, we are founders, um, and we also have a majority you know, women workforce. And we know that women, specifically women of color more than than anyone have been hit so disproportionately by this pandemic. So before we can even think about going back to the office, we need to make sure that we are setting our team up for success. And in our case, what we're hearing from our audience also really um, mirrors what we're hearing from our internal employees. We know that over 80% of our employees prefer, you know, either a fully remote or flexible hybrid remote work, and that the vast majority of them are not comfortable with returning to the office, especially without knowing that everyone's vaccinated. I will say that in all of this, you know, we keep hearing um, what is is the best way that we can set our, our team up for success. And I reminded our chief people officer the other week that there is no scenario where we make everyone happy. There are very few scenarios in which we make even the majority of our team happy. And that's really not the goal. What we are trying to do is to craft the best strategy that matches what the company needs to do to move forward. And that includes having a productive, motivated and focused workforce. And to do that, you've got to look at how parents are gonna get back to work, Mm. what is happening to their kids, ensuring diversity and inclusion standards are really up in this hybrid area. So when we think about all of that, it has really led to a lot of our decisions behind not looking at anything before January for a return, really looking at flexibility and also looking at our DEI practices and the research out there that benefits a lot of the um, hybrid environment that, that we've leaned in on. Not returning until January, Carly, that in some ways has an impact on your business. It also has an impact on your employees who are urging to get back to be in some way 
sociable again. How have you thought about that flip side? What is being sacrificed by not coming back until then? I think what we we actually thought about it the other way is what was being sacrificed by rushing to return. And I think what, you know, with the rise of the Delta variant that we're all seeing in sort of new forms of, you know, mask regulations and vaccine regulations and, um, you know, a, a scary flashback to what we all experienced over the past year, we're seeing so many of our peers walk back the policies that they announced a few weeks ago or a few months ago. And I remember when we made the decision to tell our team that we weren't going back till January. A lot of our peers, um, you know, and, and, and executives at other companies who are largely um, male dominated thought we were crazy. They're like, how can you wait till January? You've got to be in person. Productivity happens in person. And of course, there is something to be said about the productivity that can happen in person, especially in a creative environment. But what we're really prioritizing right now as an organization is one, the safety and well-being of our workforce. Two, knowing that 80% of our team was not ready to come back and also was really looking for a hybrid work work model, we need to make sure that we do that right and in a way that their safety comes first and also in a way that we're ensuring FaceTime doesn't Mm. necessarily equate to promotion time. And how do we create the career development for our team to make sure that if you are a caregiver and have to be home an extra day a week, that that has no weight or bearing on whether or not you get promoted to the next level in your career. So while at the time we definitely created, I think, a more aggressive stance, we're really grateful that we have always told our team we will not be the first back because there's a lot of lessons to be learned as we all figure out how to navigate what's happening. But Danielle, can you give us some tangible examples of therefore how you ensure that FaceTime doesn't win out, how you can make this very egalitarian community of when some people might slowly return to the office, but you're also going to be conducting conference calls with others who aren't. How, from a practical basis, do you make that work? Well, I think, first of all, it would be great if we said that, you know, we are going to nail this on the first try, but we're (laughs) not, right? We can only put out there what we hope the intent is. And this skim, you know, as we said, it's a unique place to work. We are majority women. We are majority um, women led. And so because of that, we want to make sure that our office is thinking about this, not just what they're going to do at the skim, but how this pandemic can rewrite the rules for their work future going forward. And with that, we feel like there is a responsibility that we are trying to take on to say, hey, we know that you guys would love to have ultimate flexibility, but that doesn't meet necessarily the goals that we have for the company. What we can say is that we are leaning towards a hybrid model. And with that, We want to make sure that the time in the office has a purpose. Mm -hmm. We know that men are going back to the office at higher rates than women. Let's make sure that we are putting in some minimums so that there is um, an opportunity for anyone who is in, you know, the local New York Skim HQ based area to have that time with their managers, to have that face time, because it is an unfortunate reality. I don't think that for our type of company at our size, it is possible to have a completely egalitarian view where if you are remote, you're going to be just as likely to look at someone that's in the office five days a week. So how can we make sure that there is a culture where people are getting together at regular cadences that there is um, the ability to opt in and out of certain meetings that don't need to be in person. That's really what we're working towards is to try to make sure that there is some basis that for these days, we would like you to be in person because we want to be able to take that bias out of when we're looking at Um, when we're looking at promotions two years from now, Mm -hmm. that we aren't trying to set that up at this stage. And I think the other thing that is very, very timely as we think about this week is to say, you know, it is, it's been black women's equal pay day was this week on August 3rd. We know black women earn on average 63 cents to every dollar paid to non-Hispanic white men. There is already, even without this, so much work to be done in pay equity Let's not make it worse. How do you bring transparency to pay equity at the moment, Carly? Wait, sorry, can you repeat the question? How how do you bring transparency about pay equity from your own experience at the skim at the moment? 
It's a great question. We really, um, I think the first thing is talking about it, talking about and acknowledging all these stats that, you know, the audience that we're serving also is the majority of our workforce. So we're looking at, you know, what are the promotion levels and promotion rates that we're doing internally, even just, you know, privately internally, when we've had somebody, you know, come to us and ask for a raise, just as, as female founders, we have said, okay, like, let's have that conversation. That conversation is over now, like pause. We're just going to talk to you for a second as just like women to women. This is how you should approach that conversation next time. Mm -hmm. And I think really making sure that we are walking the walk um, and not just not just serving an audience that we know is representative of so many stats that are so incredible in terms of the power that she is is holding and gaining over time, but also an audience that's really indicative of all the work that has to be done. And that's why we really call this the great her turn, which is this audience should not go back to how things were. Things were not great for her. And to, to Danielle's point, if, if women of color and black women are making 63 cents on the dollar, like that's not something we want to go back to. If women in general are still fighting for pay, pay equity and women in general are still fighting to have time to figure out childcare and figuring out mental health benefits and fertility benefits, why would we want to go back there? So first talking about these issues to our audience and internally is the, is the first step. The second step as founders and, and CEOs and operators is to make sure we're creating the policies that directly support her. And so, you know, one of our great investments internally is really on a mental health basis and making sure that our benefits are really supporting her from that standpoint as well. Lastly, therefore, Danielle, you're, what are we not talking about right now? What are, what are your audience, what are your employees asking of you quietly or looking, searching for answers on that at the moment isn't being voiced in our decision-making when it's looking at a flexible future? You know, I think that the biggest thing that I see is that there needs to be much more of a, a corporate and public partnership, that we are one startup out of so many companies out there that are really trying to get this right. But we also have our own internal pressures. We have shareholders that we need to make sure that we are, are getting returns for. We know that we need to keep driving the company forward. There is no time for pause and reflection. And so I really think that for these issues to be addressed, it can't just be on corporate America. And it certainly can't just be on um the government or else we're not going to get this done in a way that moves quickly enough. I think that there are great things out there, whether it's the thought of a caregiving czar, whether it is the thought of, you know, the Marshall Plan for moms. We want to see more of that. We want to see more discussion. And we certainly want to see more men talking about the effect that this has had for women and women of color. It can't just be a conversation that is led by women for women. We need everyone to pitch in on this. And without that, it's going to be too slow to really make an impact for any of us returning. Big table. Let's all take a seat. Thank you so much. Great to have some time with you both. Carly, Danielle from The Skim, co-CEOs. Thank you.